Good evening, everyone. I'm Andrew Waterhouse, director of the Robert Mondavi Institute and professor of enology. This evening, we're presenting a Sips and Bites program on everyone's favorite candy, chocolate. <clears throat> Thanks for being with us tonight. We have a few upcoming events, which I'll share with you at the end of the program. The Robert Mondavi Institute strives to provide the public with insights into the food and beverage innovations here at UC Davis, particularly in the departments of food science and technology and viticulture and enology. Tonight, we're going to hear from a couple of alumni of the food science program who are lucky enough to be working in the chocolate industry. <clears throat> They'll be telling you how they can use chocolate processing to make chocolates with different flavors. I hear that Guitard has as many as 300 different products. Before we begin, let me mention that your questions are welcome. Please use the Q&A tool to submit your questions. Our guests will try to answer them as they come in, so please don't wait till the end uh, to submit your questions. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Selena Wang. Dr. Wang has been the research director of the UC Davis Olive Center since 2012. She led the center's chemistry study on the quality and purity of olive oil from 2009 to 2011. This received worldwide attention and was covered by over 1,000 media outlets and led to new olive oil standards for the state of California in 2014. A few years later in 2018, she took on an additional role of cooperative extension specialist in small scale fruit and vegetable processing in the UC Davis Department of Food Science and Technology. She also conducts mission oriented research on processing of fruit and vegetables. And as you'll see tonight, she has a special interest in chocolates. Please welcome Dr. Wang. Thank you, Dr. Waterhouse. With Valentine's Day around the corner, love and chocolate on our mind. Chocolates have a large physiological and emotional effect on people. I read a survey that shows 65% Americans will be enjoying chocolates, reflect the Valentine's Day season this year, and 70% of Americans prefer, cho prefer chocolate to a bouquet of flowers. I'm pretty sure I'm one of them. In today's program, we're going to talk with two, two two food scientists graduated from UC Davis and learn what goes behind the scenes at Guitar Chocolate Company, the oldest family owned chocolate company in the country. We'll taste and talk about different types of chocolate and how flavors and texture help to bring the experience that consumers are looking for. There will be five polling questions throughout the program and to incorporate your response in our discussion. First, I would like to introduce our speaker, Thalia Hohenthal, who earned a food chemistry degree from UC Davis in the food science department in 1979. She is the technical service manager at Guitar, the company she's been with since 1983. She holds the honor of having been granted Guitar's first pack for an innovative commercial gray chocolate syrup and also help fund the Retail Confectioner International's Chocolate Boot Camp. In 2016, she was inducted into the Candy Hall of Fan. I think that's something that we all wish that we can <laughs> be inducted to. Welcome, Thalia. We're so glad having you today. Thank you, Selena. It's really a joy to be here. Thank you. Thalia is accompanied by Rebecca King, who earned a master degree from the sand department 33 years later. While Rebecca was a graduate student, she was awarded a Professional Manufacturing Confectioners Association grant to fund a two-year study of chocolate bloom and oil migration. She manages technical projects in chocolate process processing a guitar and is involved in all aspects of chocolate manufacture. Welcome, Rebecca. I still remember you working in the lab and the lab always smells so good every time when I walk by. Yeah, th those are good memories and good times and I'm happy to be here today and share them and everything else chocolate with, with you all. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so should we just get started on our Q and A's? Everyone have a lot of questions for you to want to get to know a little bit of behind the scenes stories. So the first question is, 
how did you get interested in chocolate? And I'd like to ask both of you that question and maybe Thalia can go first and then Becky. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, like most uh, people I know, I have early childhood memories of chocolate and it was very interesting right from the start. Of course, associated with some strong emotional ties, some very positive experiences. Uh, as far as career, I like to say that chocolate actually chose me uh, when I was looking for a job after I graduated. I was contacted by a company uh, very close to where I live. And that company uh, was uh, situated in a uh, in a, an abandoned chocolate factory and they were making some food ingredients and they needed a food scientist. And uh, as soon as I got there and I, the reality started to unfold that I was working in a chocolate factory and making chocolate type products, um, it, was, uh, it was a match. Um, similar to Thalia, I grew up eating sweets and chocolate and baking with my mom and always, always preferred chocolate. And um, then I started out um, an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and was unsure about food science, but as a freshman, went to the food science club to see if that's what I wanted to do. And the faculty advisor was um, Dr. Rich Hartel, and he invited me to work in his lab as a um, undergraduate researcher and said, you know, come work in my lab, see if food science is for you. I think it is. And of course, his lab focused on sugar and fat crystallization in chocolate and caramel and ice cream. So <laughs> I jumped at that opportunity and uh, he helped me get um, several internships as an undergrad um, in the chocolate industry and big, you know, international companies. And from there, I just stuck with it. There was opportunities. And um, as I started off at UC Davis uh, to work on my master's, um, Dr. Hartel introduced me to, or connected via email, um, Thalia and I, and Dr. Shoemaker, whose lab I ended up working with. Um, maybe he's listening right now. <laughs> um, and so, we all, the four of us kind of connected and I ended up doing my research at Davis on chocolate and um, kept in touch with Dahlia over the years and um, ended up working with her. So it's a small world. And yeah. I'm sure, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I was having a, a really, really difficult challenge with a particular uh, problem that we have in the chocolate industry. And it was uh, delightful to know that Rebecca was willing to take that on as graduate project or some, you know, use that as an inspiration for a graduate project. So it was uh, a really wonderful thing to know that our company was associating with University of California Davis and the wonderful scholars there. And uh, we unlocked some really wonderful uh, opportunities to solve this problem. So that was, that was great. And that's a perfect way to our next, next question. <laughs> How do your UC Davis education affect your interest ability to work with chocolate? Becky, would you like to go first? All right. Um, I think getting the opportunity to work in Dr. Shoemaker's lab and have his support uh, was extremely meaningful and his willingness to collaborate with industry and industry associations. Um, that's what allowed me to continue the path of chocolate. <laughs> and then also, I think UC Davis is extremely unique in how the food science department is in the RMI space and um, the opportunities that that provided. I mean, just volunteering and getting involved through the events and um, being able to attend those things, meet people and see other areas of the food industry outside of chocolate. Even though my research focused on chocolate, it was like, well, what about all these other aspects of the food industry? And how can you 
learn from those areas of the industry and even from other other industries and bring that into what I'm doing and become better at problem solving or knowing experts to go to like that's extremely valuable so you know fantastic education but also the opportunities outside of the classroom were phenomenal so that's helped a lot thank you I I agree with that wholeheartedly and I think it also shows in the programs that the Robert Mondavi Institute for Food and Wine and Food Science has been doing the ranges from bread to to olive oil soda um, right and there's a lot of different foods that's being discussed and educated as well so I agree with that um, yeah. and also the pilot plan having a food processing pilot plan that really gives the students some hands-on experience as well definitely and lots of perspective yeah angles Valia, what about your education at UC Davis? <laughs> yeah, so um, even though it was a long time ago, I still had to learn enzyme kinetics and uh, uh, you know toxicology, uh, food chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, food microbiology. Um, I was reminiscing a little bit with Rebecca this morning, and I told her how how it was to uh, ride my bike onto campus. Uh, go to my morning chem class, ride past the smelly hog barns, pull in behind Cruz Hall on my bike, uh, where there's like a hippie commune right behind it, uh, go into the Cruz Hall um, hallways and smell fermentations of all kinds that were kind of almost kind of sometimes not very good. So anyway, and sit down to lectures that on the outset sounded like, I know I'm going to like this, but it doesn't sound interesting. And uh, unbelievable how those, those lectures, even just like, it wasn't enough. It was so, it became the fabric of my, it became the fabric of the rest of my life. That's what I can say. So the uh, lectures on um, food carbohydrates, again, that was one of those sleeper classes. Literally, it was at 7.30 in the morning, taught by a professor who I'm sure was 90 years old at the time. And, um, uh, I learned so much there that it, it was one of those key pieces that compelled me to go on and earn this patent that we, we've achieved. And that combined with the enzymology class by Dr. Whitaker at the time. And I got back in touch with Dr. Whitaker when I had this bright idea of how we could use enzymes and chocolate syrup. And um, it had been done, but not in this particular way. We were gonna leverage some new technologies that were available. So um, that, again, that was just one itsy bitsy example. I like to say that I used every single lecture from every single class I ever took because the problems just keep coming. The challenges never stop. The uh, breadth of what I need to know, um, I get to build on the education that I had and I have a, a sound foundation and that's been unbelievably invaluable. So I uh, can't say enough about that, the actual education part. Um, and it was also fun using squirt guns to squirt uh, water onto fermenting stuff in the oven and watch it turn into sourdough bread. So just a little aside. Uh, my abilities to work with chocolate, what's been really fun is uh, working for a small, sort of small, not a really international company, uh, where this is interesting because Rebecca and I have different backgrounds. Um, I've been in the local area, uh, in, in the Bay Area, near my hometown all these years. Uh, so uh, working for a small company, um, we've had to uh, still deal with all the regulatory issues and all the um, commercial issues that big companies do. And having a link to UC Davis has given me incredible resources to make that happen. There's so many occasions, and even one recently, um, where uh, I was asked, uh, how do we find out about this? And I knew where to go to my resources at UCD. One of the real fun ones um, was, um, well, so many fun things. Okay, two things, real quick. Number one, 
when it was announced that Robert Man and Marguerite Mondavi were going to give first 25 million for the building of the RMI and to bring wine and food science together. Immediately, in a flash, I envisioned chocolate there. It was, it was obvious to me, if you're putting wine and food, it's gonna be olive oil, it's gonna be beverage, you know, it just, the whole thing, just in a flash, just reading it as an alum, that's what it all meant to me. So um, when I had the opportunity, um, so a colleague was retiring and we whisked him up to um, meet Dr. Shoemaker and the three of us cooked up a plan to uh, teach chocolate education there. And we had a good 10 year run and uh, eventually the RMI was built and some of the classes were even held there. So that, that was a, a huge success for the whole industry really. So many great memories and I find it comforting to share that a lot of things hasn't changed, right? So you can still smell, <laughs> you, you still get a lot, a lot of the smells on campus. Um, it's different smell during different time of the year. And, it, it, and I think it's really good to know that the education, what you learn in the education on paper can really be translated into your day-to-day -day, um, job, right? Even for an extended period of career. Um, so speaking of that, maybe we will ask Becky this question. Becky, can you just share with us your daily responsibilities at Guitar and something that might surprise people? All right. Um... So I'm in uh, product development here and as a food scientist. Um, so my day usually starts with a download of production and what's going on. And um, I think that's a really critical part of my job because uh, to understand what's going on in the plant, what their, their issues are, what their, you know, capacities are, the people behind all of these things, the people, how they work, what they're doing, um, how they think. Um, I think that's a really important job, part of my job because um, that's gonna affect how I develop products and then how do I commercialize them in the factory? And how do we make changes? How do we implement changes and how are they received and are they, you know, long lasting? So, um, that's, that's a critical part of my day, actually. Um, but then also the, the rest of it can vary. I can be at the bench making, making chocolate and tasting chocolate, um, which is obviously a very fun part. Um, and then we could be, you know, sitting down and planning, you know, what, what new chocolates do we need? What do our customers want? What, is that, what are they saying? Um, we could be doing some troubleshooting in the plant. We could be um, doing more intense sensory, similar to what we'll be doing shortly. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview is, is that I, I, I'm never just in one place and that's what makes it really exciting is, um, and of course seeing the projects through, that's, that's a very fulfilling part of the job and, um, you know, using all the, the critical thinking that you learn as you go through um, your schooling and, and applying that to your job. And it's, you know, working with people makes it, the people here makes it great. So we're lucky, we have a good team. Yeah, wearing many different hats. <laughs> Definitely. So I don't know if that's, um, if that's quite eye-opening, but it's definitely a multifaceted role. So, yeah, and I'm sure Thalia is, is a great mentor to you, having Polly gone through a lot of these herself. So, Thalia, we're so curious. Can you walk us down the memory lane a little bit and tell us more about your time as a student in Davis? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> gee, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> um, so some, um, some snapshots is kind of how I remember things. Um, so there's uh, food chemistry class was, was great. 
they taught us how to use the uh, uh, viscometers, all different kinds of food measurements. And I'm, I'm laughing now thinking about it because I was uh, also taking classes on campus like uh, biochemistry lab, biochem, uh, physics, physical chemistry. And those labs are really tough. And so to walk into a food lab, I thought, well, this is so easy. I get this. But that was just my, my ignorance because I didn't get it. And it actually, I had to kind of work at it a little bit because these practical things had to be presented in a scientific way. And I had to learn that there's, there's gotta be a way to kind of open up any situation and study it and turn it into data. So that was a real, that was a really great part of what happened in the food science department. Um, of course, measuring the titratable acidity in making um, cabbage into sauerkraut, that was really fun. And figuring out what the growth cycles were, the organisms that were going on there. And this stuff, it's, um, how do I say it? It's, it's really applicable to so many things. So uh, it, connected, it connected later on down the road to other projects that I had to design. Uh, what else? So uh, memory lane, I was, I was a class A nerd. I was very focused on my studies. I uh, never went to a party. <laughs> the only party I went to in Davis was sponsored by a professor of the food science department. And that was a Guy Fawkes party by Dr. Omani. And uh, he was a character. The, the greatest, do you remember? Yeah. He might be watching. So, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, I, I loved his sensory class. Um, I didn't take the classic sensory that a lot of people did. It was so innovative that it really launched me in a, again, in a good direction where I could design my own sensory experiments on the job because there wasn't some sensory department that was going to hand me a whole bunch of, uh, you know, sheets on what, what everybody should fill out and answer. So I learned how to, how to work around uh, and how to, how to invent a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, memory lane, um, aside from that, uh, making friends as apartment life, that was a big deal. Uh, and then there, was, <laughs> there were the uh, uh, food tech club meetings in the filper room. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> in the 70s, the filper room looked like quite a 50s throwback. It was, it was not modern then either. Uh, so it was uh, hilarious. And that's how I learned to make my first quiche was because we had some kind of a food science gathering where everybody had to make quiche. So, hey, um, there's some practical sides to being in the food tech club. Um, as far as learning about industry and learning about jobs and all of that kind of thing, um, I was not interested. I, I didn't care. I, <clears throat> I was there to just um, absorb everything that I could and learn everything that I could in my classes. And um, I figured the, the future would take care of itself. And, and you did. Uh, and it, worked, <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can ask, maybe I can ask you a couple questions from the attendees. <clears throat> People are very interested in finding some more about your job. Maybe a first question, do you get to travel as a part of your job? If so, where do you go? Um, <clears throat> Rebecca's gonna answer this one too. <clears throat> um, but uh, uh, for me, I guess the, the pinnacle was traveling to Belgium. Um, when I, uh, we were on a team, the guitar family uh, takes a team of uh, employees uh, every couple of years is every three years to Dusseldorf, Germany, and we study the latest equipment. <clears throat> it's an enormous trade show, and we meet with international uh, groups of uh, engineers and scientists and learn all about our craft of chocolate processing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in that, um, we were allowed to, as employees, <clears throat> we're allowed one or two days of uh, travel that would interest us outside of just the work. And when they asked me where I wanted to go, uh, I said, Belgium. And my boss looked at me 
completely puzzled. And this, this was still, I think, the late 80s and uh, before Belgian, Belgian chocolate was a thing in the US. And he looked at me puzzled, why would you want to go to Belgium? I said, have you ever heard of Belgian chocolate? <laughs> so anyway, uh, seeing Belgian chocolate in Belgium, seeing the factories in Switzerland, uh, these kind of experiences uh, professionally have been profound and in France and seeing, you know, meeting with candy makers in France that were making news back in their day at that time um, and writing books about it, all of that. So lots of, lots of cool travel opportunities, a lot of domestic travel um, to see um, uh, customers and suppliers. Um, one of my favorite trips was, is to Starbucks and meeting with their technical team. Okay. Rebecca, would you like to answer that really quickly? And then so we can get tasting started. Sure. Um, similar to Thalia, a lot of customer and supplier visits, which are always exciting just to, you know, see other factories and of course meet more people in the industry. Um, also attending uh, industry events. Um, so there's like this uh, Professional Manufacturing Confectioners Association. That's a big, um, they have a big event every year on the East Coast. So that's, that's fun to travel to. Um, and learn as well. They present a lot of research papers specifically relevant to the confectionery and chocolate industries. Um, also some international travel. Um, in a previous job, I was um, going to uh, the Netherlands um, to visit the um, cocoa manufacturing over there. Uh, maybe you all have heard of Dutch cocoa. So it comes from the Netherlands. Um, so that's impressive to see all the beans coming over on ships and, you know, all the history there is really impressive. Um, and then uh, more recently with Guitard, um, going to do some work in Korea with um, some co-manufacturing. So that's, that's been exciting. And now moving on, <laughs> I see the cues. It's time. <laughs> Would you like us just to talk about the 100% chocolate? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll start with the 100%. So it's this bar, I've already dived in, dove into mine. So that's why it's a little. Um, so the 100%, um, we're starting here because it's the darkest, meaning it is, um, 100% cocoa beans. It's just made of cocoa. There is no sugar. Um, it's going to be bitter when you eat into it. So hopefully um, I'm giving you all a heads up and you don't have any surprises there and like, where's the sugar? Um, so we're starting there uh, because we don't want the sugar and milk and thaw you'll get into this more. Um, we don't want that to be lingering on your, on your palate. And um, so we're going to start here with the darkest. And um, as I said, it's 100% cacao, meaning it is just made of cocoa beans. Um, so I think that this is a good place to start too, because it's really, it's showcasing the chocolate. And this is something that guitar does really well. So um, we're gonna start here. And I think now that you know what it is, you know that it's just cocoa beans, um, no milk, no sugar. Um, we should go ahead and taste, and <laughs> maybe you already have, but um, yeah, get a little piece. Um, they're, they're little um, bars here, and like I said, just a bite is enough. You don't need a whole square because it is going to be bitter, and we get used to this over time, so <laughs> Dolly is probably like, not a big deal. I, I like <laughs> sugar. Um, yeah, so go ahead and taste and, and think about if you can get past that bitterness, what what kind of notes are you tasting in regards to the chocolate? So one of the questions that we had received is that, is there like a sensory wheel for chocolate? You know, there's sensory wheel for wine, for olive oil, for honey. Is there a sensory wheel for chocolate? There's at least one. I, think every, I think every company's written one. <laughs> um, so... Sure, and we'd, we'd, we'd love to share it out with people if they wanted to uh, get back in touch with us. Okay. 
Um, but we'll give you some tasting notes on this one to get people started and um, we can hopefully connect people with the uh, wheel. Um, but this one, um, hopefully you guys get the deep chocolate notes and um, it's, a, it's a kind of a bright chocolate. So um, not, not very roasty. It's got some sourness poking through there. Um, a little bit, excuse me, a little bit of floral and some spice and lingering like vanilla notes. And there's no added vanilla flavor. It's simply all of this flavor is just from the cocoa beans. And if you are having trouble getting past the bitterness, try um, a sip of water and then revisit it. Um, that kind of might help you pull out some, some of the other flavors. Um, and this is kind of a delicate chocolate flavor with all these kind of layers and hit, hidden notes in there um, compared to other 100% baking bars you might see on the market. So that could also be a fun little comparison to do. Um, but here specifically, um, just getting into a little bit about how we get those flavors. And like I said before, um, Guitar is so good at uh, celebrating the inherent flavors of the cocoa bean and the growing regions. And um, I think this product does that really well. So that's one of the reasons I chose it um, for today. So they select the cocoa beans, in this case, mostly uh, South and Central America. And then um, they go through a cleaning process and they're gently roasted to preserve these sour and floral notes but also bring out the chocolate notes. So there's a balance there and also um, some food safety to roast, um, reduce moisture, things like that. So um, that's a little bit about the processing and then we grind them up and they become, you get that smooth texture and the fat liquefies. So we're able to mold it into a chocolate bar and um, you can use it in so many ways. The bar is very convenient for not only eating, you can break off a little square, um, but also you can chop it up, use it in cookies. Um, it's good to melt and you can dip things. Um, one of our guitar chefs recently made uh, marshmallow dipped in this product. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things you can do with it. But my favorite is, um, the gourmet brownie recipe on the inside of the box. So if you are if you bought this and you're like, I don't know what to do with it, that's my go-to suggestion. Um, it's a really, really good um, brownie recipe and I think celebrates the, the uh, flavor of this particular chocolate. And I think Becky, you can you see the results from the poll? Yes, I just okay. got a pop up on my screen. So, so Maybe you can just quickly talk about that and then we can move on to the next sample. Okay, so we thought it'd be interesting to see how you all would use it. Um, now that you know a little bit about it, you've tasted it. Um, so this is interesting. A good portion would eat as is about almost yeah 9%. That's interesting. Um, I'm with you all on that one as well. 7% um, would chop it up for cookies. I think that's a good use because it brings a different dimension of flavor um, compared to the like semi-sweet chips. Um, a third would melt it for brownies. 36% uh, would make it melt it into chocolate to make confections. Um, again, a very solid use for it. And 14% wouldn't use it. So that must mean the bitterness uh, got to them. Um, and another part of this is it's cool to use because you can um, decide your level of sweetness. You can add a lot of sugar to it in a brownie or something, or you can make a really dark, bitter ganache. So it's very versatile. And I think that leads well into Thalia's next. Yes. So we're going into taste semi-sweet chocolate baking chips next. And just while so, everyone is getting ready and taste, maybe uh, Thalia, just really quick, can you can you talk about the difference between bittersweet and semi-sweet chocolate? Is it solely based right. on the cocoa content or are there other factors? 
Right. So um, bittersweet and semi-sweet are in the same category in the US government standards of identity. So if we want to take a deep dive into where these there's some primary source information, that would be in the FDA standards of identity. So that means uh, that if the chocolate has at least 35% cacao mass or bitter chocolate, it can be categorized as either semi-sweet or bittersweet. The idea that bitter is stronger, the industry has certainly um, established some norms. And for our company, we figure that if it's greater than 60% cacao mass or bitter uh, chocolate liquor, that we're gonna call it bittersweet. And less than that, anywhere between 35 and 60 would be considered a semi-sweet in our product line. So that's the full, <laughs> full answer. So should we jump in for, um, uh, let's see, we're gonna um, read this question out loud, tasting semi-sweet, pick your top descriptor for the essence of the chocolate taste and your top emotion while eating this. So, um, you can pick as many of these as you want, I guess. Um, oh, we've already got results. Everyone's already eaten it and I haven't even tasted it yet. <laughs> so holiday spice was on the low side. Roasty came up strong. Astringent is uh, not too pronounced. People feel calm or they feel excited, but mostly they feel happy. So um, I like seeing that um, eight, eight, uh, 58% have the happy emotion going on there. That's great. And sure, roasty, I would actually agree with that as well. So I'm gonna taste it now. Um, the big deal here is you get some sugar, um, to kind of balance out what you had going on before if you're tasting you. in sequence with us. Um, it's kind of like the sugar alone is gonna make you happy if you're a sugar addict like some of us. Um, as the chocolate flavor unfolds, uh, and it, it almost kind of unpacks if you leave it on your palate for a while. And this is a very interesting thing about this liquor blend. So I want to point out, this is a different source of cocoa beans than the one we just tasted a minute ago. It is not fruit forward as the one we tasted a minute ago. And uh, the roasting conditions for this bean blend allow us to uh, just sort of get more flavor out of it, more of the deep, dark brown flavors. So yes, if you're sensing roasty, absolutely. We've got a little more roast going into this, uh, more browning. Um, uh, one of the reasons this is one of my favorites, um, like sort of who doesn't like semi-sweet chocolate chips, but uh, this one is fantastic for having around all the time. Uh, you can make just about anything chocolate that you need to. Um, and of course, that's one of my hobbies. Um, so it's, uh, it perfumes the air with a fabulous chocolate smell when you're baking chocolate chip cookies. It's um, fantastic to melt down and use in batters. I, I know a, a chef who uses this as a vegan cake recipe, and the patrons prefer it over a standard chocolate cake recipe. So um, it's a uh, very dense chocolate flavor in this bean blend, and it will work well. It, you can make a melt it down and use it to make um, ice cream. You can use it to make little chips in ice cream, uh, cho hot chocolate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's versatile in many ways because of the density of the chocolate flavor that's there. So that's my statement there. Great, thank you. Should we move on and taste? The next one? The milk chocolate, yes. The milk so, chocolate. Um, the milk chocolate, um, I, <laughs> it's almost empty. Um, okay, so <laughs> truth be known, um, I, I mean, again, I don't know what it is that, that drives me, but um, I love dark chocolate. I mean, I, I only almost ever eat dark chocolate, but um, once I get my hands on some milk chocolate, I kind of can't stop eating it. So there's that. Um, so, so maybe I can, because this is important. We're doing this at 6.40 p.m. Is there yeah. such a thing as decaffeinated chocolate? There are some people who mm -hmm. cannot eat chocolate at night because it might keep them awake. Yeah. So um, uh, chocolate has um, uh, less than um, 
10% of the caffeine of coffee. And it's like a third of the caffeine of um, a weak tea. Um, no, no decaffeinated chocolate that I know of. We just go for a, a milkier one, or I suppose you could have white chocolate. Okay, so I thank you. That that helps us to know how much we should eat. Maybe the whole yeah. bag. Um, yeah, that would the be whole fine. bag of milk chocolate is fine. So, <laughs> so I think the polling questions up. So pe those of you who have samples, you tasting and answer your question, and we'll discuss the the milk chocolate. Yeah. So I want um, as you taste this one, you want to tease apart the complexity. So we, we designed this to be one flavor when you eat it. We don't design it to be little individual flavor, um, flavor bursts. But if you focus while you're eating it and tease out what is the sugar, what is the milk, and what is the chocolate flavor, I want to know how do people put a, an aesthetic value on that? What uh, do they feel is the strongest of those, uh, those three components? So we'll get our poll back in rapid style here. Yeah, the milk. All right, so I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see if people can make a judgment around that because I'm gonna tell you, I'm sort of undecided. <laughs> That's what keeps me coming back for more is that especially between the milk and the chocolate, I find those intensities to be very similar. Uh, especially I like the lingering chocolate flavor, but no doubt the milkiness is strong. And it's um, in this particular product, it's a little bit of a caramely flavor, uh, but not a heavy caramel note. And uh, it has what we call a developed chocolate flavor. When we do our conching, we apply uh, certainly time and temperature as any sort of um, heat treatment. Um, it's not a cooking of the chocolate. It's low temperature compared to real cooking. What is but, the temper um, temperature? Well, um, that's a secret. Oh. <laughs> so we, we can pick mm -hmm. just sort of about mm -hmm. any range we want. Um, but when we, when we apply this heat, we are creating some new, uh, new reactions and studying organic chemistry, of course, is part of this. So um, Maillard reactions and uh, the Browning reactions are uniquely developed during the chocolate processing. And we, um, uh, you know, we kind of pick our times and temperatures and the ingredients too. The milk that goes into this is a non-GMO milk because we wanted this to be, um, or non-GMO project certified, uh, verified. Um, and so we source a little different milk and it gives us um, quite, quite a lovely uh, developed kind of mm, sort of richer than, richer than uh, caramel in a certain way. Great. And I think we, you mentioned chemistry a little bit, so maybe we can address one of the questions that's related to a chemical compound, flavonoids. They're known as the healthy components of chocolate. Do flavonoids have flavor? Do they contribute to the flavor profile of the chocolate? Um, so um, I think so. Chemist, biochemist. I think so. Um, and there might be others here present who know more, much more about this than I do. And um, I would, I would dare say, uh, people have told me, I haven't studied this for myself yet, um, but people have told me that um, some of the astringency will indicate that uh, we have a presence of flavanols or flavonoids. So um, this, again, this particular um, bean blend uh, is the same. I was going to say, I didn't get to make that point, that the milk chocolate and the dark chocolate have the same bitter chocolate component added to them but at different intensities and one with milk, one without. So we get completely different reactions going on. I'm gonna point back to the chocolate that Rebecca had us taste. It's not a strongly astringent chocolate, but I bet you if we could analyze these, we'd find that the one Rebecca um, picked for us had um, more of the flavanols present than those that, uh, that are in uh, my two favorites here. Great. But thanks for asking. Let's let's take a deeper dive into that <laughs> when we can, Selena. Yes, I think it's probably contributing some bitterness similar to tea and and then also a stringency, which is similar to wine, right? 
So I think we're ready for the next polling question, which is basically comparing the last two chocolate that we tasted and ask the participants to pick the strongest character difference. So we have nutty, brown, and caramelly. So given the last two chocolates are formed from the same bean blend, pick the strongest character difference. So not talking about what the chocolate liquor itself is contributing, what other differences do we find? Nutty, brown, or caramelly? I might have to, go back and I have to go back and taste the first taste one. It. While we're <laughs> waiting for this, I want to squeeze in as many questions as we can out of you too, while we have you here. What kind of chocolate is most popular in the US and what is the difference between American chocolate and European chocolate? Rebecca, do you want to jump in on this one? Sure. Um, I mean, I don't have the data to support this, but just based on if you go to the grocery store and look at the candy aisle, um, it's a lot of a lot of milk chocolate. Um, but that being said, in the so-called craft chocolate space, it's dark. It's like these high percentages and even high percentages for milks are starting to become more and more common. Um, so that's that's kind of my um, observations on that side. And I think, you know, a lot of us grew up with with milk chocolate most likely and maybe gravitate towards that as some sort of comfort or nostalgia so and then difference between american and european chocolates well um i mean we, oh, i'll answer that one real yeah quick. um yeah and then we can talk about the so, polling results um so what's fun is that um we've kind of made it um a hobby here at guitar of knocking off all the chocolates from around the world so we don't believe that any of it has to do with regionality really it's just a matter of um philosophy so do do you want to make a chocolate that tastes like this do you have an open mind about what chocolate should taste like etc so european chocolate um those those ideas are actually sort of 30 30, 40 years old now, because there's been so much invention and experimentation in the US. Uh, it used to be that the finer textures, the smoother textures and the uh, richer flavors were attributed to uh, European chocolate. Um, there's, there's a lot of competition now. Thank you. And the polling results, looks like most people voted caramelly. For caramelly, yeah. That, that milk character really runs the show. The and I hope people, running. Yeah, yeah. And I hope people enjoyed that. I hope they enjoyed um, experiencing that. I really enjoyed it. So should we answer more questions? This is an important one too. Are you concerned about climate change impacting the cocoa trees? What is Qatar doing about ensuring their supply chain is sustainable? I know this, we could spend an hour or two days on this topic, but maybe just a quick top level answer. Um, uh, go ahead, yeah, go. Okay, um, I was actually just talking recently with um, our director of sustainability on this and um, yeah, climate change is, is a concern. Um, and specifically, we, we were talking about the um, deforestation and, um, you know, the desert kind of creeping into cocoa growing regions in Africa. Um, so it's definitely a concern. And so he talked a lot about um, reforestation and um, diversification. So in, for cocoa, that means um, having the benefit on the um, and kind of the ecosystem side is you have, you're not a mono crop. So you have more crops growing in, on, on a so-called cocoa farm. You have more, it's not just cocoa. And that's also good for the farmers because then they're not as reliant upon the cocoa prices, which are volatile. So that's, that's kind of a, um, definitely we're concerned and, and Guitard is definitely involved with that and the Guitard family. Um, definitely invest a lot of that and, you know, 
prior to the pandemic was, you know, making trips over to cocoa growing regions all over the world and, and making the presence and helping with education. And um, that I think that means a lot. And um, I'm happy to be a part of a company that's doing those things. Dalia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to say also on sustainability, um, uh, our company is really known for wanting to see the sustainability of the flavor, that that is what we sell. It's the joy, it's the happiness that comes with the flavor. And preserving that is, uh, has turned out to be a bigger struggle than you'd believe. So it's definitely a mission of this company and the owners, and they're extremely dedicated to that worldwide and um, really, really put, put everything into that. Yeah, and then something that's not, we need to have every company and every industry to get on board as well, right? So, but it's really good to know that you guys are doing your part as well. Um, more questions? Is, what about a single origin chocolate? Is, 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 can we talk a little bit about that? Do you think that will be more of the future direction or, or that kind of have reached its peak? I'll give, I'll give a short answer and then we'll hear from Rebecca on this one too. So um, the short answer, um, it's fascinating to taste the beans made into chocolate all, as a single origin. It's, I think it's fascinating because it really does reveal the bouquet of flavors that chocolate is. Chocolate is not just one thing. So um, it's an important thing to do if you're going to be a chocolate scientist <clears throat> is to break it down into those components and experience it. But that doesn't always mean that you have a saleable product. It doesn't always mean that you have uh, uh, an important um, consumer product. So uh, we've even had a hard time convincing some chefs to really um, get on board. I mean, there, there's not a lot of uh, stimulation there. So a single cocoa bean has, uh, can have a lot of impact, but it in, a, in and of itself is, is not as dynamic as a blend. That's my experience, Rebecca. Um, I think there's also some, or specific origins that are um, very popular for their flavors, like Madagascar, for example. A lot of people gravitate towards this kind of dark cherry fruity flavor. It's um, very popular. I was at an event in 2019 um, where we were selling to the consumer, and that was the first one to go out. It was it was kind of cool to see that the response to it because people could taste it right there, and then they you know, just want to buy that right away. Um, but then to Thalia's point, that's not true of every, you know, necessarily every origin. So. Yeah, thank you. And we're, now we're going to save the rest of the time talking about your products. Someone asks um, about the difference between your Acoma extra semi-sweet chocolate chips versus your semi-sweet chocolate chips. Can you share the difference? Is it in the beans? Is it secret that you cannot tell us? No, that's a great question. So um, <clears throat> starting off, the uh, recipe is different. There's more bitter chocolate liquor or more of the bean blend in the Acoma chip. And it's an organic chocolate. So we've chosen uh, from organic growing regions. Not all cocoa growing regions are organic and uh, not all growers are organic certified. So we had to go out of our way to find uh, beans that are appropriate for an organic um, certification. And it comes up uh, with a um, it comes up with a more of a sour flavor uh, than a deep roasty flavor. So the tilt is interesting, but I think the way we roast and process it um, gives us back um, uh, a, a sort of a lot of value, if you will. Rebecca, do you have any thing no. chime in on that? No. Okay. So I think we, we have a lot of people who have concerns that they are having trouble finding your products. One in particular is someone likes your melt and mold for truffles and mm. it's becoming very hard to find. Do you have any tips for them? Where does a home confectioner have access to that given that it seems like now it's being sold um, by pallets 
through wholesale? Uh, so there's a um, there are a couple websites that um, are longtime friends of Guitard. One of them is Chocosphere, C H O C O S P H E R E, Chocosphere.com, and WorldwideChocolate.com, and you'll find a variety of our products. The Mountain Mold product is no longer a retail product for Guitard, and so uh, consumers would have to buy it through these other. Uh, opportunities. And then what about just for regular people like me, which I just want to buy guitar chocolate, where, where should I go and find them? Other than your website, which I think a lot of us have bought out all your products. Yeah, that's what I heard from, from the um, sample room where they fill the retail orders. It's going like crazy. So I think there was, I think this event generated a lot of interest. Um, Anyway, uh, honestly, with COVID, everybody's been staying home baking chocolate chip cookies, and we have had a hard time keeping it on the shelves. So that's that's the backstory, and we sell it everywhere we can as much as we can. And so has, um, has the consumption increased since COVID? Definitely. Or sales? sales it saw the consumption. same kind. It saw, saw the chocolate saw the same kind of increase as alcohol. And you could bake with wine and chocolate. <laughs> that sounds like a great recipe. So can attendees re get recipes? And another question is, does Guitar off offer tours post-COVID, of course? Um, definitely guitar recipes are available on the website. I've tried a lot of them myself. Um, so that's a fantastic resource. Um, there's also a guitar cookbook, family recipes, and um, also they have a little mini pamphlet. I'm not sure quite how to get your hands on that. It was on the website for a while, um, but there's a lot of resources. And, and of course, on the packaging, um, those are uh, well-tested recipes, but there's also a lot more involved recipes on the, on the website. And we have fantastic pastry chefs developing this stuff. So. And as far as I know, we you don't offer tours, right, to to the public. Right? Not unless you're not unless you're Dr. Charlie Shoemaker, and uh, he says I have a group of students that I want to bring in. So anybody like that, um, they can uh, they can see if they can twist our arm and see uh, for educational purposes. Uh, so connections groups. with UC Davis will help. That that would <laughs> okay. help tremendously. Last question, <laughs> quick fire. What is your favorite chocolate um, guitar product? Becky. Um, I really like the 100% bar we just tasted for something dark, but then um, there's a, a chocolate that we launched last year in our professional line. And it's very, very, very milky and very, very vanilla forward. And it's just rich and just that like if you want something really rich and luxurious, um, that's that's something good to eat. Um, I, I don't know that I would bake with it, but if I wanted to just eat chocolate, I like that one. And then there's a Hawaiian one that we make, a 55%, uh, no milk in it. And that's that's another one I really like. Thank but you. And, Tal one. and Talia? For, yeah, for me, it's our 150 year anniversary bar. It's the best chocolate I've ever tasted. Uh, we put every bit of love and passion for chocolate making into selecting the beans and making up the blend uh, to make our um, uh, a special chocolate for 150 year anniversary. And it's available in a little uh, two ounce, 2.65 ounce eating bar on our website if there's still some available. Um, yeah, so. Great, thank you. This is the end of our program. I would like to express our deep gratitude to Thalia and Rebecca for sharing their insights with us today. And big thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope that we will have another event on chocolate together and tasting in person in the near future. Thank you. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And um, I'm sensing the joy of the nearly 200 people that have been on this uh, event with us. And um, it's been wonderful to uh, kind of chat about this with Rebecca too. And thank you, Dr. Waterhouse for hosting us. Thank you, Selena, for your leadership on this.
Yeah, thank, thank you so much. It's it's fun to be involved with the university. Well, we really appreciate your your discussion tonight. It got a lot of interest, lots of questions. Uh, we'll try to well, maybe we'll be asking you some uh, follow up questions to get back to our attendees who didn't get to their questions. But anyway, it was a wonderful, fun evening and a tasty one, too. So thanks a lot. Um, I like to close with um, telling you a little bit about our future events. Next week, we are co-hosting a savor lecture on aromas. I'm sure you'll all be interested if you like chocolate. Professor Sue Ebler will be talking about how she dissects aromas into its various components. And then Harold McGee, very famous food writer, will be speaking about his new book on aromas. Uh, and uh, the, the discussion between the two, I'm sure, will be quite fun. Later in the month, we're going to have a forum lecture on cultured meat. So this is not like the commercial products that are uh, made from vegetable pro uh, protein, but this is actually meat made uh, in a test tube, as it were. We're going to hear about <clears throat> this exciting research program going on here at UC Davis, trying to figure out how to make this commercially viable. And you'll also hear from a major player in the business from Memphis Meats. Uh, next month in March, we'll have our next Sips and Bites will be on mead, the best beverage you have never tasted. Uh, if you're interested in getting samples for that, please sign up soon and you'll get uh, once you register, you'll be able to purchase the meads uh, to have them sent to you. Uh, in March, we also have a cleanse lecture coming up on wine business uh, with the Pioneer and online wine sales. It's a very timely choice since uh, online sales have skyrocketed in the pandemic. So I hope to see you at one of, or more of our future events. Thank you so much for coming tonight and good night.